Today we're going to be looking at Great Zimbabwe. So Great Zimbabwe has been described as one of the most dramatic architectural landscapes in sub-Saharan Africa. We are going to look at the ruins of a magnificent ancient city. The knowledge we have of the people of Zimbabwe is complemented by what we actually know about the site of Mapungubwe. which appears to have been the center of Shona civilization around 1000 CE. The largest Mapungube settlement found in the Shashi Limpopo area are very similar to Great Zimbabwe. Wealth in Mapungube was based on cattle production, ivory trade and gold. The Mapungube culture seems to have spread into western parts of Zimbabwe. With the great rise of Great Zimbabwe, it appears that trade shifted and Mapungube declined as an important center, because, becoming abandoned just as Great Zimbabwe prospered. When a German explorer named Karl Much arrived in the area to conduct the first archaeological survey in 1871, he concluded that the city was so impressive that it could never have been built by Africans. Instead, he associated with it with King Solomon's biblical site. At that time, it was believed that Africans never had the sophistication needed to smelt iron, work gold, and build kingdoms. So there was an argument about who built this great city. The white minority went as far as saying that the Egyptians had built it, the Queen of Sheba had built it, the Phoenicians built it. By the mid 20th century, there was a growing weight of evidence that said Great Zimbabwe was home to and it was built by Africans. To view that the buildings were inspired, the view that the buildings were inspired by um, Arabs or Phoenicians actually found wide, widespread appeal amongst the first white settlers of what became known as Rhodesia. So this colonial view of the past or the settler paradigm provided a moral justification for the European colonization of this part of Africa. The first scientific archaeological excavation at the site were undertaken by someone called David Randall. McIver for the British Association in 1905 to 1906. In medieval Rhodesia, he wrote of the existence of a site um, in the site of objects that were of Bantu origin. So he was the first in 1906 to assert that the architecture of Great Zimbabwe actually showed exclusive African origin and influence. He was followed by someone called Gertrude Caton Thompson, who examined Great Zimbab the Great Zimbabwe site in 1929 and agreed with Randall McIver as to its local origins. Now, in mid-1929, Gertrude concluded after a 12-day visit of a three-person team and the digging of several trenches that the site was indeed created by Bantu, the Bantu. She had first sunk three test pits into what had been refuse heaps on the upper terrace of the hill complex. And producing, this produced a mixture of um, remarkable pottery and ironwork. She then moved to the conical tower. Um, I will, you will see um, later in the lecture what the conical tower is. And she tried to dig under the tower, arguing that the grounds there would be undisturbed, but nothing was revealed. Some further test trenches were then put down outside the lower great enclosure, which is another site, and in the valley ruins, another site, which unearthed domestic ironwork, glass beads, and gold bracelets. So Thompson immediately announced her Bantu origin theory to a meeting of the British Association in Joburg. 
So now in the 1950s, Roger Summers, Keith Robinson, and Anthony Whitty independently excavated at Great Zimbabwe and confirmed its indigenous origins. And then finally, in 1973, Peter Garlake argued that its origins were ind indigenous. However, the pressures from the government were such that in the 1970s, both Summers and Garlake left the country for upholding their scientific views. There are other historians, many other historians and archaeologists who have carried out valuable research um, of Great Zimbabwe. So now we're going to look at what is Great Zimbabwe. So Great Zimbabwe is a ruined city in the southeastern hills of Zimbabwe, near Lake Mutirikwa and the town of Masivingo. Great Zimbabwe had been built and occupied by the ancestors of the Shona people. It was the capital of the Kingdom of Zimbabwe during the country's late Iron Age. It is the site of African civilization dating back to a thousand years ago. Great Zimbabwe was constructed about um, 1100 CE but abandoned in the 15th century. Great Zimbabwe is found in the area of the Zambezi and Limpopo River. It is situated at the southern edge of the Zimbabwean plateau. So Great Zimbabwe lies close to two other highly prized ecological zones. The hills, um, the hills north of the site are part of the gold belt of a metaphor, metamorphic rocks that produce heavy and very, and very fertile red soils. Um, the country just south of the site descends into drier and more open grassland suitable for cattle rearing. At its peak, it could have it housed up to 18,000 people. So Great Zimbabwe, gave, um, Great Zimbabwe gave its name to Zimbabwe when it became independent in 1980. Now we're going to look at the stonework of Great Zimbabwe. Marvelous, it had quite marvelous stonework. So one of its most prominent features are its walls, some of which were over five meters high and which were constructed without mortar. So mortar is workable paste, which hardens to bind building blocks such as stones and bricks and concrete masonry units to fill and seal the irregular gaps between them. Spread the weight of them, it spreads the weight of them evenly and sometimes to add decorative color or patterns to masonry walls. It's basically a soft mud or clay as those used, um, it's used between mud bricks as well as cement mortar. The ruins of Zimbabwe are comprised of dry stone walls and numerous Dhaka, structures of varying sizes. Thousands of granite blocks were used to construct the city. Many of the structures are made of rectangular blocks cut from nearby gran granite um, outcroppings. So Dhaka sounds like when you say it in Kosai Dhaka was used as a as binding for naturally weathered granite and stone these materials okay so these walls are constructed from granite blocks gathered from the exposed rocks of surrounding hills since um the this rock naturally split into even slabs and cannot be broken into and 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 can be broken into portable sizes it provided a convenient and readily available building resource for them. So the function of these stone walls, however, has been um, actually misinterpreted. At first glance, these massive non-supportive walls appear as if they were used for defensive reasons, but scholars doubt they ever served as a defensive purpose and have argued instead that the cattle and people were valued above land. 
which was in any event too abundant to be hoarded. Um, the walls are thought to have been a symbolic show of authority designed to preserve the privacy of royal families and set them apart from the commoners. So it is important to note that the walls surrounded the later adjoined the the, um, the walls surrounded the later adjoined huts made of daka, mud and thatch linked with them to form a series of courtyards. So daka was also used to form raised seats um, in particularly significant courtyards and was painted to enrich its artistic effect. So since Zimbabwe's Dhaka elements have long since eroded, the remaining store walls provide only partial evidence of the architectural original appearance of the kingdom. So the stone curves, um, the stones, as you can see in the picture, they actually curve and flow along the contours of the ground with nothing besides gravity and extreme architect architectural precision of those who built them to keep them in place. And, and as I said earlier, that millions of bricks were used um, to build this. Um, so the city's name derives from the Shona, Shona term, Zimbabwe, meaning house of stone. At its peak, Great Zimbabwe had a population between 12,000 to 15,000 settled over the 720 hectares of the present day monument. The ruined structures are the remains of an ancient capital which controlled most of the present day Zimbabwe. So, as you can see in the picture, the stones, um, before we move on, are what we call carvilinear. So, this clearly demonstrates that the architecture was indigenous and that no geometrical designs from the Middle East or Asia were known at this time. Um, the stone structures did not interlock, they leaned on each other. The word also great distinguishes the site from the many hundreds of small ruins now known as Zimbabwe's spread across the Zimbabwe highland. There are about 200 such sites in, the, in Southern Africa such as Bumbusi in Zimbabwe and Manikeni in Mozambique with monumental mortalist walls, walls. Great Zimbabwe is the largest of them all. So the ruins of Great Zimbabwe are some of the oldest and largest structures located in Southern Africa and are the second oldest after nearby Mapungubwe in South Africa. Okay, so now we are going to look at um, how Great Zimbabwe is divided into four main archi architectural zones. Okay, so we've got the hill ruins, then we've got the Great Enclosure, then we've got the valley ruins, then we've got the peripheral settlements. So the first three components constitute the core or the central part of Great Zimbabwe. The inner perimeter wall separates the hill from the valley and, great, and the great enclosure. A second low stone wall, the outer perimeter wall, which runs around the southern and western sides of the great enclosure and the valley ruins, separates these areas from the surrounding peripheral areas. So looking at the hill ruins, the hill ruins are to the north of the site. The hill complex is the oldest and was occupied from the, ninth, from the 9th to the 13th centuries. The wall is founded on several uneven granite boulders and is one of the monument's most spectacular pieces of engineering. The occupation of the hill goes back to the early farming period when the communities had not yet the technique of dry stone walling. Stone wall building began on the hill. The largest of these structures on the hill is the western wall. It is said to be the finest architectural construction on the site. Rough 
granite rubblestone blocks form distinct enclosures accessed by narrow, partly covered passageways. It is considered a royal city. The west enclosure is thought to have been the residence of successive chiefs. The east enclosure is thought to have been, it, it is actually thought to have served ritual purposes. It is believed that, um, it is believed to have been the spiritual and religious center of the city. Next, we're gonna look at the great enclosure. The great enclosure was occupied from the 13th to the 15th centuries. The great enclosure is situated across the valley and adjacent to the hill complex that we just spoke about. It's the outer, it, its outer wall is about 11 meters tall. At its highest point and approximately 225 meters long, making it the largest single prehistoric structure in sub-Saharan Africa. It contains a number of internal stone closures. An inner wall runs along part of the outer wall, forming a narrow parallel passage, 150 feet long, which leads to the conical towers. In the image, we can see the great enclosure, the entrance of the great enclosure. So inside the great enclosure, there's a series of living quarters in brick. Um, the brick was made with a mixture of granite, sand, and clay. Huts were built within the stone enclosure walls. Um, inside each community area, other walls mark off each family's area. And it was generally comp comprising of a kitchen, two living huts, and a court. Next, we can see the, um, the valley ruins. So the very valley ruins are located between the hill complex and the great enclosure now. And it contains most of the architectural features of the hill and great enclosure. The valley ruins are a series of living ensembles scattered throughout the valley. A striking feature is that there are parallel passages connecting individual enclosures in the valley enclosures and the great enclosures. The site served as a hub for commercial exchange and long distance trade. So archaeologists have found porcelain fragments originating from China, beads crafted in Southeast Asia, and copper ingots which um, from trading centers along the Zambezi River and from Central African kingdoms. What we see in this picture is um, a mon monolithic soapstone sculpture. This is a monolithic um, soapstone sculpture of a seated bird resting on a, a re resting on atop a register of zig zigzags. It was unearthed here. Um, the pronounced muscularity of the bird's breast and its defined talons suggests that it represents a bird of prey. The scholars have conjectured it could have been emblematic, emblematic um, rep or representing of the power of the Shona king as benefactors to the people um, and the incessor, in, intercessors with their ancestors. So we'll come back um, to this artifact um, later on. In slide 13. And then next, we're looking at the peripheral settlements. So, there are a number of peripheral enclosures within the monument and immediately outside it. Um, they encircle the core of central Great Zimbabwe. So, we can see here the image of um, the Great Zimbabwe's Great Enclosure and adjacent ruins looking um, southeast. And um, these are what is called the conical tower. So all of the walls of Great Zimbabwe, as we had said earlier, were constructed from granite um, hewn. 
locally. While some theories suggest that the granite enclosures were built for defense, these walls, um, as we said earlier, had no likely had no military function. So many segments within these walls have gaps, inter, inter, interrupted arcs or elements that seem to run counter to the needs of protection. So the fact that these structures were built without the use of mortar to bind the stones together supports the speculation that the site was in fact it was it was not in fact um, intended for defense. Nevertheless, these enclosures um, symbolize the power and prestige of the great rulers of Zimbabwe. So the conical tower of Great Zimbabwe is thought to have had fun uh, functions as a granary. So according to tradition, a Shona ruler shows his generosity towards his subjects through his granary, often distributing grain as a symbol of protection. Advancements in agricultural cultivation among Bantu-speaking people in sub-Saharan Africa transformed the pattern of life for many, including the Shona communities of present-day Zimbabwe. Um, there's also, it's been said that it also may have been uh, what is called a phallus symbol. So a phallus symbol is like a religious symbol or object. It is a powerful symbol that is used to promote something in that society. For example, some phallus symbols have been used to, uh, let's say, promote fertility or protection and many other things in a society. So now we're going to be looking at interpretations of these um, architectural zones. So it has been suggested that the complexes represent the work of successive kings. Some of the new rulers founded um, a new residence. The focus of power moved from the hill complex in the 12th century to the great enclosure, the upper valley, and finally the lower valley in the 16th century. The alternative structuralist interpretation holds that the different complexes had different functions. So the hill as a, as a temple, the valley complex was for the citizens, and the great enclosure was used by the king. Structures that were more elaborate were probably built for the kings, although it has been argued that the dating of findings in the complexes does not support this interpretation. So now we're going to be looking at architecture artifacts that were found um, in Great Zimbabwe and trade. So the most important artifact that was recovered from the monument are the eight Zimbabwe birds. These were carved from um, soapstone on the tops of monoliths, the height of a person. So the stone birds are the most famous objects found in Great Zimbabwe and are now the symbol of, um, of the nation of Zimbabwe. Um, only eight birds are known. The birds are mostly perched on the columns, such as the one you are seeing in the image. image. The birds are all about 33 centimeters in height, and the overall column, including the birds, are about 1.6 meters. They seem to be stylistically um, form two groups. The first consists of those that squat with bent legs on rectangular plis and have horizontal beaks, and the other group with the legs hanging down onto the rings they perch on, um, all have round columns and point their beaks vertically. So now looking at um, the Zimbabwean flag, so look at the stylized version of the bird, now appears on everything, um, even on the nation's flag. Also, we see here the representation of the protective bird appears on these coins. Um, I think these coins have become like abandoned relics now. So the first bird was taken from Zimbabwe by a European called Willie Postel in 1889. He found four birds on the hill of um, uh, the eastern enclosure. Um, 
placed in what he described as an old ruined wall. Despite the protest of the local Shona living in the area, he cut one of them from its column, the bed you are seeing on the right, and stored the rest in a secure place. The bird he later, it's, it has been said that he sold the bird later to Cecil um, Rhodes and, is, and it has remained um, as a part of his estate in Cape Town ever since. So Karl Much, the German we spoke about earlier, um, the, a German geologist ex, um, and explorer was the first European to visit and write about Great Zimbabwe. Moog apparently never saw any of the stone birds, or at least did not mention them. Much has been written about Moog and his assertions that Great Zimbabwe must have been um, biblical land of offer and connecting it to King Solomon and King Sheba. So these ideas have, of course, been discredited. Moog was um, guided to the ruins by someone called Adam Renda, who is usually credited with being the first European to visit the ruins. So this German-born immigrant to America later became a hunter in Southern Africa. And then in 1868, he had become stranded in the area of Great Zimbabwe. And it is said that he married a Shona woman and settled in her village. So now going back to Cecil Rhodes, he also embraced the idea that Zimbabwe was um, a biblical land. And he used this idea to justify um, his occupation of the area that was then known as Mashona land by his British South um, African company. He kept the birds in Cape Town in his, in his residence, um, excuse me, known as Hruteskir. And that is where it has remained. When he remodeled the house in 1893, um, there is an architect by the name of Herbert Baker. He would incorporate these symbolic birds into the decorative um, into the decorative mo motif found throughout um, Hruteskir. So when Great Zimbabwe was first discovered, it was believed that there was no way, as we said earlier, that um, it could have been built by an African race. And um, so now we're going to be looking at another image here. And this photo was taken by an Associated Press stringer with the following title. And it said, Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe holds the lower portion of the ancient stone sculpture, the Great Zimbabwe Bird, at the ceremony in Zimbabwe. On Wednesday, May 14th, 2003, the sculpture was officially handed over by the German ambassador, Peter Schmidt, um, who was on the second left, and the Zimbabwe Home Affairs Minister, Kembe, Kembo Mohadi, on the left. Um, Germany returned Wednesday the carved base of the Zimbabwe bird that has spent near a near 100 years in the hands of European collectors and the museums. <clears throat> now we're going to look at other artifacts that have been found in Great Zimbabwe. There's been um, other pottery, iron gongs, elaborate worked ivory, um, iron and copper wire, iron hose, bronze, spearheads, copper ingots, um, and crucibles and gold beads, bracelets, pendants, and sheaths. Um, there's been Syrian glass, Chinese sedalon dishes, mostly from the Ming Dynasty, um, Persian um, bowls, coral, bronze bells, and iron spoons, um, glass beads from the Arabs, coins from other African civilizations and gold that may have originate, originated in Great Zimbabwe. Now we're going to look at um, the Great Zimbabwe inhabitants. So the ruling elite appeared to have controlled wealth through the management of cattle, which were the staple diet of Great Zimbabwe. 
At its height, Great Zimbabwe is estimated to have had a population um, greater than 10,000, although the majority lived at some distance from the large, sto large stone walls. Only about 200 to 300 members of the elite class are thought to have lived within Great Zimbabwe's massive walls. Now looking at wealth and trade. So the monumental architecture um, reflects the settlement's power in the region and its wealth, which was primarily based on cattle husbandry, cultivation of crops, and domination of trade routes between the gold fields on the Zimbabwe Plateau and the Indian Ocean to the east. So gold was mined and traded to the outside, but the real wealth of Great Zimbabwe um, is, it has been said, it was in the huge herds of cattle they controlled. So the economy of Great Zimbabwe relied on the management of livestock. In fact, they may have allowed, um, cattle may have allowed the Shona people to move from subsistence agriculture to mining and trade. So iron tools have been found on the site, along copper and gold wire jewelry and ornaments. Great Zimbabwe is thought to have prospered perhaps indirectly from gold that was mined 25 miles from the city and that was transported to the Indian Ocean port of Sofala, where it made its way um, by Dao, which was a sailing vessel, up the coast and by way of Kilwa Kisiwani to the markets of Cairo. Um, Kilwa is one of the two great East African ports. The other second great port was called Songo Mnara. They are situated on two small islands near the coast from the 13th to the 16th century. The merchants of Kilwa dealt in gold, silver, pearls and perfumes um, Arabian crockery, Persian earthenware, and Chinese pors porcelain. So much of the trade in the Indian Ocean thus passed um, through their hands. So trade contacts between Zimbabwe, the between the Zimbabweans of the southern African interior, and the Swahili of the east coast had been established well before um, 19, I mean 900 CE, and by 1250 CE the town of Great Zimbabwe had become an important commercial center. So Great Zimbabwe was part of a larger system. It was a rich trading kingdom. It is thought to have dominated from the Zambezi to the Limpopo rivers, including modern day Zimbabwe and Mozambique. So as we mentioned earlier, items um, that have been found in um, Great Zimbabwe were from, were from China, Persia, and all over the Indian Ocean trade network. It was the largest stone um, town in Southern Africa. Remember, it is not the first, nor was it the last either. About 200 others existed across the region, which had a similar architecture. This perhaps suggested that there was a long-lasting spread of culture. The descendants lived all across Southern Africa. Okay, so Great Zimbabwe was also well positioned to control trade routes to the Indian Ocean coast for the export of gold and other resources of the Southern Plateau. So long-distance trade contacts were therefore made through the Indian Ocean coast with Asia and the Middle East and also land routes were opened to enter ports on the Southeast African coast. Arab and Swahili merchants plied these routes with merchandise, such as glass beads, cloth, Chinese cedulon, and blue on white porcelain ve vessels. So more often, the Swahili relied on local African middlemen known as Bashambazi, who took their goods far into the interior. These goods were bartered for gold, ivory, animal skin, and the state exacted tribute for goods sold or passing through its territory. <coughs> so datable imported goods are important in um, archaeological studies in determining the antiquity of this monument. 
by cross dating. A copper coin, um, a copper coin at Kilwa, the coast of Tanzania in the 14th century, was found at these ancient Zimbabwe ruins. So you're thinking to yourself, why? Why would such a great, magnificent, ancient um, city collapse? Okay, <laughs> so there is no agreement on the reasons for the decline of Great Zimbabwe. So the possible cause is that the capital's population became too large as a result of which natural resources such as grazing and firewood in its immediate vicinity became depleted. Um, the environment was completely exhausted and could no longer support a population of thousands of people, each with their own fields and livestock. Um, the photographs of the very earliest European travelers shows that the area was still largely treeless and it appears that it took centuries for the woodland to recover to its present level. So the population split up and left Great Zimbabwe. Some went southwest to the Torwa, capital of Kami, near present-day Bulawayo. And the bulk followed the Matupa King north into the Zambezi Valley to the Mwene Mutapa capital near present day Mount Darwin, where there were several small but well built Zimbabwe's. So to the to this effect, around 1430, Nyatimba Mutota, a prince of the Zimbabwean royalty, headed out to the large chunk of his army and waged war against the Tawara people living in the Zambezi Valley. He and his followers managed to defeat them and secure the area. Soon, Nyatimba declared himself king and founded the Mutapa Kingdom. With its center of power at the Zambezi Valley, a huge chunk of the Zimbabwean army followed him and abandoned the kingdom of Zimbabwe. This led to a civil war now between the two kingdoms, which led to the defeat of the Zimbabwe people. They lost a large part of their territory and trade to the Mutapa. And by 1550, the entire kingdom was absorbed into the Mutapa kingdom, with only a few outlying settlements inhibiting the ruins of Great Zimbabwe. There are many speculations about this mass exodus, some historians state that it was because of lack of resources and food. Others claim that the decline was due to the gold mines in Zimbabwe territory declining. Okay. So now we're going to conclude. So Zimbabwe was a descendant of another great Southern African kingdom, which was Mapungubwe. Great Zimbabwe stands as one of the most extensively developed centers in pre-colonial sub-Saharan Africa and stands as a testament to the organization, autonomy, and economic powers of the Shona people. The method of construction of Great Zimbabwe are unique in African architecture and, and, and although there are examples there are examples of similar works elsewhere, none are distinguished and as imposing as Great Zimbabwe. So Great Zimbabwe's architecture is important because the ruin is the largest stone structure south of the Sahara Desert. It is still standing, which allows researchers to learn more about the techniques of its building and the lives lived in and around it. Um, Great Zimbabwe was made powerful due to its location near 
several well-traveled routes, being able to trade with uh, nations in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Europe, um, benefiting Great Zimbabwe immensely. Thank you. Thank you guys for attending the lecture.